Welcome to the fifth episode of Our Vices, a short program about the office of the vice presidency, specifically focusing on each vice president's time in office in three short questions. Question number one. How did Elbridge Gary become vice president? Born in 1744 in Marblehead, Massachusetts, both sides of Gary's family were successful shipping merchants. An intelligent kid, Gary enrolled at Harvard University at the young age of 13. Several years later, his master's thesis argued the righteousness inherent in resisting taxation by parliament. After Harvard, Gary worked the family business, and the Garys became one of the wealthiest families in Massachusetts. In 1772, Gary won a seat on the Massachusetts legislature and became a known associate of Samuel Adams and likely a member of the Sons of Liberty. On the eve of the revolution, Gary's background in shipping proved useful as he led the efforts to supply the city of Boston during the forced port closure and further chaired the committee responsible for obtaining, transporting, and hiding guns, powder, and lead in anticipation of the outbreak of hostilities between Great Britain and her colonies. A clear patriot, Gary was selected to be part of the Massachusetts delegation to the First Continental Congress in 1774, but declined due to the death of his father. However, he did represent Massachusetts through much of the Revolutionary War as a delegate to the Second Continental Congress all the while continuing to manage his supply network in support of the Continental Army. Elbridge Gary, in retrospect, considered signing the Declaration of Independence the greatest moment of his public career. He would later serve in Congress after the war, as it was under the Articles of Confederation, our first constitution. And when that government proved inadequate, Gary participated in the Constitutional Convention of 1787. During the process of creating the government we still use today, Gary served as the chairman for the committee that ultimately crafted the Great Compromise, creating a two-house legislature, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Gary actually opposed giving the vice president the responsibility of presiding over the Senate, fearing the vice president would just be a puppet of the president and used to break down the proper separation of powers. In the end, Gary was one of just three delegates to vote no on the passing of the new constitution finding he could not vote yes on the mere promise of a forthcoming Bill of Rights. Gary represented the extreme end of the Anti-Federalists. After this, Gary had the misfortune of being an Anti-Federalist and later a Democratic Republican in a Federalist stronghold state. He became the perennial loser in the run for governor, but managed to win a seat in the House of Representatives representing Massachusetts' 3rd District. In 1797, after Thomas Jefferson refused John Adams' request to lead a diplomatic mission to France, Elbridge Gary went with two others in what followed became known as the XYZ Affair, where French officials identified as X, Y, and Z tried to extract a bribe from the diplomats before opening negotiations. His companions leaving him, Gary stayed in France determined to make something of his trip and to give no cause for the French foreign minister to make good on his threats, which only hurt his reputation back in the States. And during the following quasi-war with France, Gary remained extremely suspect and unpopular for years, until the correspondences of the French foreign minister were published and redeemed poor Elbridge, who had already retired from politics. Jumping ahead, it would not be until 1810 that Gary won the race for governor of Massachusetts, in this role, he is most remembered for signing off on the redistricting of state senate districts, the districts redrawn in such a fashion as to maximize the election of Democratic-Republican candidates. The Boston Gazette lampooned this manipulation, calling it gerrymandering, likening the odd shapes of the districts to creatures like a salamander. Not only do we continue to mispronounce Elbridge Gary's last name in gerrymander, but unfortunately, this is what he is most remembered for. In 1812, Gary lost his re-election for governor. James Madison, facing his own re-election, had no running mate, as Vice President George Clinton of New York had died and his position remained vacant, as there did not yet exist any way to replace a deceased vice president until the 25th Amendment. Running against James Madison was none other than Clinton's nephew DeWitt from New York, 
DeWitt's popularity in New York meant that Madison could not count on a useful New York running mate, as Jefferson and Madison, both Virginians, came to rely upon for votes in the North and would have to look elsewhere. At the Democratic-Republican caucus, John Langdon of New Hampshire actually won the nomination for vice president, but declined as he had his mind set on retirement. The second-place nominee was Elbridge Gary. Gary was older and unlikely to challenge the Virginia dynasty with a run for president in 1816, but he was a founding father with a long career behind him. Gary was a supporter of Madison's policies, especially his decision to go to war with Britain. Lastly, Gary was a northerner to help balance out the ticket of southerner Madison. As was the tradition of the day, Gary did not campaign for himself, but relied on allies to give speeches and publish pieces on the merits of Madison and Gary. Madison won his re-election 128 to 89 electoral votes versus Clinton, without winning a single electoral vote in Massachusetts. Meanwhile, Gary only garnered two out of the 22 vice presidential electoral votes in Massachusetts. It's safe to say Elbridge Gary's name did little to help Madison's re-election. Nevertheless, that brings us to question number two. What did Elbridge Gary accomplish as vice president? When Gary first took office, it had almost been a year since the United States had a vice president. As a testament to the dwindling prominence of the position, people did not seem terribly concerned about the vacancy. As vice president, Gary continued to support Madison's agenda and the ongoing war effort in the Senate with his tie-breaking votes. President Madison in kind consulted Gary on presidential appointments throughout New England. These two facts alone demonstrate that Madison and Gary had the most functional president-vice president relationship since Washington Adams. In June of 1813, both Madison and Gary were seriously ill. Gary himself may have just survived a stroke. Knowing both men might actually pass away in the near future, Gary presiding over the Senate refused to yield his chair, as was tradition, toward the end of a session so that the president pro tempore of the Senate could be elected. Unlike today, the president pro tempore was next in line for presidential succession after the vice president. If Gary did not block the vote, it was likely Senator William Giles of Virginia, a known opponent of the War of 1812, would have received the position. By refusing to yield his seat, if indeed both Madison and Gary died, and the pro tempore position was left vacant, the Speaker of the House would become President of the United States, who at the time was war hawk Henry Clay. Fortunately, both the President and Vice President survived the year. In 1814, the British burned Washington, D.C. to the ground. Luckily, the ailing Gary was in Massachusetts when this occurred, but was horrified upon his return to see the condition of the nation's capital. With the war going badly, it was Elbridge Gary himself who reported to President Madison that an extreme faction of New England Federalists were toying with the idea of seceding from the United States. This would be confirmed by reports of some of the discourse that occurred during the Federalist Hartford Convention, which unfortunately, Gary never lived to learn about, as he died in office on November 23, 1814, of a heart attack. Which brings us to our final question. What legacy did Elbridge Gary leave during his term as vice president? Gary's time as vice president, like his predecessor, was more an acknowledgement of his lifetime of accomplishments in service of the nation from the very beginning as one of our founding fathers, rather than a post meant for Gary to distinguish himself. Gary's time as VP amounted to less than two years, and yet in that time he cast 10 tie-breaking votes in the Senate and modeled a supportive relationship with the president, which through the darkest days of the war, ensured a strong executive.